Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us as we attend now to the preaching of his word. Our Father in heaven, will you give us the grace that we need outside of ourselves by means of your Spirit's power to give us understanding of, of the word of life. Give us not only understanding, we ask, but conviction of sin, the grace of repentance, so that we might more fully and purely praise the name of our triune God. You are worthy of our praise. We pray as we open together the book of Psalms. What a great gift you have given to your people the gift of, of your spirit recording words for us that are sometimes too deep for us, able to, to articulate and to speak emotions and, and thoughts and feelings that we have trouble expressing. A way to look into our own souls and, and see with honesty what is there, and also to look at the world around us and to reflect upon the cries of those gone before us and reflect upon your faithfulness in all circumstances and all ages to all of your people. Bless us together as we consider your word that we might glorify you and love one another. Amen. As you're taking your seat, will you turn with me to, to the book of Psalms, to Psalm number 5. We wrapped up last week uh, the Gospel of Matthew after a number of years being there, and has been my, my pattern over the last several years as I've transitioned from book to book to do a short mini-series on the Psalter. Uh, it, it's my conviction we can't get enough of the Psalms. The, this is a great gift to us, given by the Lord himself, given by the Spirit of Christ, to help us explore the full range of our human experience. I dare say there is not a single emotion known to mankind that is not articulated and expressed in the book of the Psalms. The Scripture tells us that the Spirit is a help to us when we don't know how to pray. And sometimes we, we might be tempted to think that that's a, some sort of a mystical experience, that the Spirit of God just sort of downloads something into our brain when we are absent the words. But may I propose to you something much more tangible and much more objective, the Spirit has given you 150 prayers in written form when you don't have the words. Diagnostic tools for your own soul as you read through and reflect upon the words of the Psalter. So this week, we'll consider Psalm number 5. Uh, next week, Psalm 11. We'll do two more Psalms in October, and then, Lord willing, the 1st of November, we'll begin a new series in the book of Philippians. We'll study the New Testament letter to the Philippian church. But the Psalms are different as we've come from a gospel. That's one genre. When we come to the Psalms, it's an entirely different genre of literature. The Bible exists in not just one form, but all different kinds of literature. We have history. We have gospels. We have, we have historical narrative. We, we have poetry. And here, uh, we have God's Word to us comes in poetic form. And uh, sometimes that is distant to us particularly in a modern age, we don't read a lot of poetry. Uh, it, it's a discipline. It's, it's a skill that has to be honed and developed. Reading poetry in general, and the Psalms in particular, requires a sort of slow reading, uh, a, a sort of careful chewing on the marrow, a reflection, a meditation, a constant prayer. Poetry takes work, but the payout is, is substantial. When we do when we discipline ourselves, not just to read a psalm, but, but to dissect it, to carefully consider it, to read it over and over again over a period of days and weeks, to allow the Spirit of God to wash over us by means of that particular psalm. You may not know this, but the, the book of the psalms, the 150 psalms, is actually divided into five distinct books. And, and over the next several weeks, I want to select several from the first book. Psalms number 1 through 41 constitute book 1 of the Psalms. And there's an overarching theme. You could express this maybe in one word. Old Palmer Robertson says, one word 
describes that whole section. It's confrontation. Confrontation. In fact, he goes on and he says, The Lord God Almighty rules eternally over heaven and earth, but the mystery of iniquity has arisen to challenge his sovereignty among humanity. In response to this challenge, through covenant and promise, God has committed himself to redeem an innumerable host from every tribe, kindred, language, and people to be his own. The instrument by which this redemption will be accomplished is a singular saving hero who in the fullness of time will enter into mortal combat with Satan himself. As a consequence, confrontation will characterize the whole of human history until the consummation. I dare say we can look around and read the headlines or if you're on social media or any of those kinds of, of media, the word confrontation is not a stretch, is it? It's not a stretch to think that our world is marked by that concept of confrontation. And Psalm number five certainly fits within this theme. The title of the sermon today is, is Rejoicing in the Refuge of the Lord. Rejoicing in the Refuge of the Lord. We have only 12 short verses here, but there is much. And I hope uh, by, by preaching the sermon today, I will provoke you to go and study further on your own the precious words of God to us here in Psalm number five. I want to point out to you uh, the structure here. We can look at Psalm 5 in really five stanzas. You want to call it five verses, that's okay. Five stanzas or five sections. But the way it's structured, it's not just in, in, a, in a linear order. What often happens in, in Hebrew poetry is that the emphasis, the most important part, is right in the middle. Sometimes in Western literature, the, the, the climax happens at the end. In Hebrew poetry, it's often right in the middle. And we find the same thing here. We actually have three different, three different sections, but, they're, but they, they're not in like one and two and three and four and so on. You actually have verses one through three that pair up with the very last two verses. And we end up having sort of, a, in my mind, it's almost like an arrowhead. We have these out to outer components, verses one through three and 11 through 12. That's our first section, the perspective of the righteous. And then the next layer, the peril of the wicked, verses 4 through 6 and 9 through 10, form closer. And then right at the arrow's head, right at the tip, verses 7 and 8, the promise of Yahweh. So that's our, that's our outline as well, the perspective of the righteous, the peril of the wicked, and the promise of Yahweh. See if you see that structure as I read it aloud. Psalm number 5, hear the word of God. To the choir master for the flutes, a psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destructive. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels because of the abundance of their transgressions. Cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing, let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with shield. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's, let's consider in those first three verses and in the last two verses the perspective of the righteous. The perspective of the righteous is, is an expectation of being heard and received by God personally and, and even protectively. The result of such a relationship with God is assurance of refuge and protection from all enemies. Those enemies both within and without. 
Let me ask you this. When you think about God, when you think about the concept you have of God, especially in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of trial, in the midst of hardship and difficulty and opposition and confrontation, how do you think about him? What do you think about him? And we're going to see, particularly in the second and fourth stanzas, that the psalmist has real enemies, and they're vicious. They're relentless in their attacks. They are wicked with their tongues and with their their minds and with all that they are. And how does he think about God in the midst of these kinds of confrontations? Do you imagine a God who is far away? Do you imagine a God who's disinterested in your struggles? Do you you imagine a God who doesn't really even know you? Will you find in this God, if you go to him, will you find in him only more sorrow? Maybe a rebuff or a rejection? Will you find in him danger, or will you find in him protection and refuge? What do you believe about this God? Look at verses 1 through 3. Look at the expectation of our psalmist here. There is some debate among scholars. It's titled, the original title is a psalm of David, and whether this was actually written by David himself or written in the manner of David. Uh, is, is, is open to some debate. Almost all of the psalms in that first book, Psalms 1 through 41, are attributed to David. I think there are two exceptions there. Uh, but there is, there is some, some historical references, for example, a reference to the temple that would come after David. So there's some discussion about whether or not David is the author or not, um, but I will refer to him interchangeably as David or the psalmist in, throughout the sermon because the author himself is, is ultimately the Spirit of God. The human author is, is not as important to the message of the psalm. Verses 1 through 3, David says, give, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. David begins with a very personal plea. And he comes in boldly and says, Hear me. Your children do this to you. They come barging into the room and say, Mom, listen, or Dad, you have to hear me. And there's an expectation because of the relationship that they're going to be heard. There's there's an expectation because of their standing as your child that you're going to receive them. So too, here with David, he says, Give ear to my words. There's an expectation of being heard, of being received by God. Verse 2, there's an expectation of being known by God and of knowing him. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my king and my God. David doesn't say the God or the king, my king, my God. This is personal. One commentator says, we do not speak into space, we speak into the ear of the Lord. Do you think about that? When you call upon the Lord, you are not just, you know, we we have scientists who have these these big satellite arrays and they're broadcasting radio signals into space, just wondering if something, someone out there will hear and respond. And sometimes I think people pray like that. We're just sort of broadcasting this and hoping maybe something, somebody will hear. And respond, but that is not the prayer of God's people. We pray with an expectancy. We pray with with a a full expectation that God hears us and receives us. Notice the psalmist begins his day by deliberately orienting himself to this God who is personal and near. Look what he says in verse 3. Oh Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch in Hebrew poetry, one of the things that, that is, is a point of emphasis is when you see repeated words and phrases. Twice, he says, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare. The word sacrifice is, is provided by the translators. It's not there in the original language. In the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare it for you. My prayer, I, pray, I prepare this for you and watch The New King James says, I will direct it to you and I will look up. That's the idea in the word. 
It's not just a general watching. It's a particular orientation of the watching. I come to you, my Lord, and I look up. I look up. Every day, every day needs from us an intentional recalibration of our perspective, doesn't it? My, my good friend, Dr. Means, is my optometrist. He's also uh, a fellow pastor at our sister church just up the road here in Willis, and he's, he's given me what he calls the 20-20-20 rule. When I'm studying or when I'm focused on something in detail or when I'm, I'm carefully evaluating something in front of me, every 20 minutes you need to look up and focus on another object 20 feet away for a minimum of 20 seconds, 20-20-20 rule. Well, if that's important for my physical vision, to maintain healthy physical vision, how much more is it important for our, my spiritual eyes to reorient myself? day by day by day. How much more important is it that that I stop regularly, that you stop regularly and look up? Not just to look up from the page that you're reading, but to look up from your life and say, I have a God to whom I am accountable, but I also have a God who hears me, who receives me as a child. But how often, instead of beginning our days by looking up to our king and to our God, how often do we spend our days by looking down instead? We begin the day by looking down at our phones. We roll over, that's the first thing we grab. We look at our news feeds, we look at at our email, we we look at our text messages, we, we look down to our problems and our worries, we look down on our busy schedules and all of the demands that are upon us, rather than looking up to our God and saying, this is the one who has made me, and the one who is providing for me, and the one who has delivered me. The psalmist says that in the morning, the Lord hears his voice and receives his prayers. In the morning, David looks up and beholds his God and his king. And he starts there. This is far better than a 20-20-20 rule, isn't it? David goes on, though, to express his confidence in corporate ways as well. We see this, here's this parallelism. Verses 1 through 3 run parallel to verses 11 through 12. Look what happens in verse 11 through 12. David goes on to express his confidence in, in, the, in a, not only individually but corporately. David is not boasting here in some sort of unique, special experience that he has because he's king or because he's a prophet of God. This is not some unique thing that David alone shares. Look at verse 11. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. This is not some unique perspective for King David. The psalmist's perspective is that all who take similar refuge in God will cause will find cause for rejoicing. Derek Kidner, and I would commend to you, he's got a two-volume commentary on the Psalms that is wonderful. It's worth, just his introductory material is, is worth the cost, especially if you can find it used somewhere. It's a little two-volume set. Derek Kidner, K-I-D-N-E-R. He says this, commenting on verses 11 through 12, he said, although danger is not forgotten, note the defensive words, refuge and shield. The psalmist now breaks free of his loneliness. He is no longer a man praying on his own, hemmed in by his foes, but is conscious of a whole company who can join him in praise. Isn't that good? As as we begin the day, as we look up to the Lord, are we conscious? There's a whole company of believers, some of whom we won't meet in this life. People from every nation and tongue and tribe and people, people who don't look like us, people who don't even speak our language, but they also were calling on the name of the Lord. They are looking up to the same Jehovah, the same Father, and he is good and mighty to save them as well. David's confidence rests firmly in the character and the covenant-keeping nature of God, and his confidence is reinforced as, as he contemplates in, contemplates this mercy, he participates among an entire people who are able, just as he is, to praise their king and their God in the midst of adversity. He says, for you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. 
David knew what the Apostle Paul would later say in very explicit terms. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against unseen powers, against principalities, and all kinds of rulers in the heavenly realm. David understood this as well. He had physical, tangible, literal enemies who were attacking him. But he also recognized his adversaries were primarily spiritual, and that God was a shield to both. As we make our journey in Psalm 5, for again, from the out, working from the outside in, we come to the second and the fourth stanza. So we see the perspective of the righteous in that first and fifth stanza. Now in the second and fourth, we see the peril of the wicked. Unlike the righteous that are in the first and the fifth stanzas, the wicked are not heard by God. The wicked are cast out. In fact, they face extreme peril. Notice that David is still continuing in prayer to his king and to his God, and now he turns his attention in prayer to the wicked. Look at verse 4 through 6. David is continuing in prayer. He says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. Here David has just expressed his confidence. I come every morning to my God. I come, and he hears me. He receives my words. But the wicked, you don't delight in the wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. We notice here that the wicked are not only a peril to David, but the wicked are a peril to themselves. They are both a peril and they are in peril. The psalmist's central charge against the wicked is lying. It's deceit. That is what that is what is is the the is underneath all of the evil deeds of the wicked is deceit. Look what he says. He, the language that he uses, they speak lies. They are deceitful. There is no truth in their mouths. They flatter with their tongues. This is a key characteristic of the wicked. This is not only true of David's immediate enemies. But it's true in every time and every place. The wicked are marked by deceit. We see this very clearly in the book of Romans. In the very first chapter, Paul says that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Why? Because they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It is an active, willful deceit first of themselves and then of others. And this this shouldn't surprise us. This is precisely what the serpent did in the Garden of Eden, is it not? The serpent lied to Eve and to Adam. And our Lord told the Pharisees that Satan is their father because Satan is the father of lies. In John chapter 8, verse 44, To the Pharisees, Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. When he speaks, he speaks out, or when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. Saints, there are many false religions, and many of them claim to be Christian. Many of them name the name of Jesus, and they are false religions, and they attempt to seduce God's people with these kinds of flattering tongues, with these kinds of lies, with these kinds of of no truth in their mouths, and they attempt to seduce God's people with these alternative systems of morality, alternative systems of spirituality alternatives to what righteousness looks like. Even things that are most fundamental to the Christian faith, concepts like love, have been wholly redefined. Words have been twisted and perverted to mean something that you'll not find anything in the scriptures that is remotely close to what the world says the definition of love is. And that they will say, you aren't loving because you're not like this. It's a deceitful tongue. One commentator commenting on verse 9 
if we look ahead in the, in the, the next part, this would be the fourth stanza. David says, for there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. See, isn't that exactly what Jesus said about Satan? When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. That's a synonym for their inmost selves. Jesus said it's not what comes into a man, but what goes out of him is what defiles him. Out of the heart come lies, adulteries, all kinds of evil thoughts. Verse 9 of Psalm 5, For there is no truth in their mouth, their inmost self is destruction, their throat is an open grave, they flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels because of the abundance of their transgressions. Cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. A commentator named Don Williams, commenting on verse 9, says this brings us to the central issue of the psalm. No wonder the psalmist groans and cries for help. No wonder he addresses God as the one who destroys those who speak falsehood and who abhors deceitful men. No wonder he prays for the Lord to reveal his way and guide him in it. His enemies come with murderous hearts and words that are not to be trusted. They manipulate the truth for their own gain. Behind the disguise of life lies death. Only the light of God can protect the psalmist in the midst of such illusion and confusion. Now, this commentary was written more than a decade ago. But listen to what he says next. Verbal violence is as much an epidemic for us as it was for ancient Israel, and we too fail to see the depths behind the cunning. Programmed hype, the slick sale, the unkept promise, the false hope, the seduction, all these are and more mask not simply political lies or useless products, but death itself. With our minds filled with verbal and visual nonsense, we find ourselves distracted from the real questions of life, our meaning and destiny. Part of the design, part of the intention of the wicked is to distract from the truth. If they can't get you to believe, it's almost like a screw tape letter. If they can't get you to believe the actual lie, we'll distract you with something that isn't true. We'll give you something shiny to play with so you won't pay much attention to the truth. Brothers and sisters, may our God and our King protect us from such lies, from such deceit, from such flattering tongues. Let us not think, not, not, not puff our chests out and think, oh, we're not susceptible to that, we know better. Let us not think that we are not able to be sucked in to all manner of deception. We are bombarded daily, sometimes hourly, with false fears, with contrived catastrophes, and with solutions that, that direct us away from God and away from a trust in his divine, divine deliverance. David says, you bless the righteous, O Lord, you cover him with favor as with a shield, and we go anywhere but him for our protection. Notice in verse 10 how the psalmist responds to these threats. Now again, he's still praying. This prayer might make you uncomfortable. This prayer of David might make you uncomfortable. He says, make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Literally, it means condemn them. In, in the ESV, it's translated here with five words, make them bear their guilt. But in the Hebrew, it's one word. And it is the word that is, is exactly the opposite of the word justify. I mean, if we wanted to make up a word, we might say guiltify them. We could say condemn them. It is the concept of, of it's the opposite of justification. Press their just condemnation upon them. And he goes on to say, let them fall by their own counsels. Such is the confidence that David has in the decrees and in the power of God, and such is his confidence that the wicked are a peril not only to him but to themselves, he actually prays that God lets them have their own desires. He prays, God, let them fall by their own counsels. It's remarkable, isn't it? But there's an example 
from the life of David in the Old Testament, where David prays this exact prayer. This isn't theoretical. This isn't because he's just writing poetry and this has sounded really good. This is exactly what he prayed on another occasion. On the occasion when his son Absalom stole the hearts of Israel and committed treachery against his own father, David had a trusted advisor named Ahithophel. We've got some babies on the way, just a suggestion. Ahithophel. Not really. But here's something that the the Scripture says about Ahithophel. This is in 2 Samuel. Now, in those days, the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the Word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed by both David and by Absalom. This was a trusted advisor. This was the inner circle. This was his main man. After Absalom betrayed and David is having to flee Jerusalem. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 31 records this. It was told David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. Can you imagine that kind of betrayal? This is not just a, a political advisor. This is a close confidant. This is a friend. This is someone who's been in his bedchamber. This is the one who's been near to him, who's dined with him. And he said, Absalom is conspiring against you, and Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And here, you know what David's prayer was? And David said, O Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Let him, let him perish by his own counsel. And just a couple chapters later, that's exactly what happens. Ahithophel kills himself. Such was David's confidence in the sovereign plans of God. Such was his conviction that the deceitful schemes of the wicked would end in their own ruin that he could pray, let my enemies gain the fruit of their own wicked counsel. And he prays that God would condemn them. There is a whole genre, subgenre within the Psalms of what's known as imprecatory prayers. Those are prayers that can make us as Christians sometimes very uncomfortable, but they are there for our use. All Scripture is profitable, and it is right and just. Now, one of the ways that we pray for the destruction of our enemies is they, if they be slain by the gospel itself, that they would come to the, just be ruined and confess their sin and repent and turn to Christ, and that he would utterly destroy them in that way. But if not, it is right and just for us to pray for their destruction. It is right and just for us to pray that the enemies of God would come to nothing. In fact, that they would be hung by their own rope, so to speak. The perspective of the righteous in in the first and fifth stanzas, and then the peril of the wicked in the second and fourth, now moves us to the central feature, the central message of the psalm. And it's the promise of Yahweh. It's the promise of Yahweh. Look at verses 7 and 8. Here's David. He's he's right sandwiched between two prayers about the wicked. And he says, But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Where is the psalmist's ultimate hope? I mean, where does his supreme and final confidence rest? And we might wrongly conclude that David's confidence rested in his own righteousness and goodness. I mean, he said he's contrasted himself against the wicked. We might conclude that that David seems to think that he has rightful access to God by means of his own merit, by means of his own good deeds. But that isn't the case at all. In fact, this is the same David who in Psalm 143 would say, enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. David understands this. David is not coming and pleading his own case. David says, it is through the abundance of your steadfast love that I will enter your house. David knows he is dependent upon the Lord for all things, including his righteousness. 
Derek Kidner again. He says, the very integrity of the judge, which would be David's undoing if he were under rigorous moral scrutiny, is his refuge under wrongful attack. David, the plaintiff, knows that if God were to try his character instead of his case, he would be undone. This is taken for granted in the psalmist's protestations of innocence. That's true of us too, isn't it? If, if God were to try our character instead of our case, we would be undone. We are dependent upon the righteousness of another. So what is David's hope? David's hope is, is the same hope we have. It's the same hope we, on which we must depend God's covenant keeping love. David says, but I. Here's the contrast. And again, his statement here is sandwiched between two stanzas on the prayers about the wicked. And David says, but I, through the abundance of your steadfast love. Some of your translations may say your mercy, your exceeding mercy. It's the Hebrew word has said, but it's it's a word that has a, a a lot of meaning compacted into that short word. It is, it is a picture of God's covenant faithfulness rooted in his eternal love within the Trinity poured out upon his people. This is, a, this is an enduring love. It's a covenant love. It's a merciful love. It's a loving kindness. All of those are various ways that same word gets translated. David says it is through that covenant keeping loving kindness, supreme mercy, that I come and stand in your presence. And through that alone. It's by that means that I come before you. The key difference between David's enemies and him is what? It's the mercy of God. David has been shown the deceitfulness of his own heart. That's what makes him different. David has been delivered from the peril of his own sin. That's the difference between he and his enemies. In the book of Hebrews, the apostle to the Hebrews is writing in chapter 9, and he's fleshing out this very thing, that we needed a high priest who would go in our stead. And in Hebrews 9, verse 11, we read this, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Now let's think this through. David says, it is through your abundance, through the abundance of your steadfast love that I will enter into your house. The house is a synonym for temple. It's the place of dwelling of God. David says, I will enter into your dwelling place. I will enter into the very presence of the true and living God according to your steadfast love and mercy. David believed a promise that had been made to him but not yet revealed. Saints, to us it has been revealed in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the writer of the Hebrew says, it is not by the blood of bulls and goats that Christ himself entered into this temple. It was by the sacrifice of his own blood the writer goes on in that, same, in that same section, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised inter- eternal inheritance since the death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. David here says, through the abundance of your steadfast love, I will enter your house, I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. David anticipates the Redeemer who would come. The writer of Hebrews is writing to us very plainly about that Redeemer who has come in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and by by the sacrifice of his own body and blood, he has provided a way for us to enter into the very presence of the living God. It is a divine mercy alone revealed in the person and work 
of the Lord Jesus Christ that gains us access to God. So now as we go back and think about the psalm again from the beginning. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. On what basis does the Lord hear his voice? Because David has been cleansed by believing the promise of the Redeemer who would come. If you are in Christ today, you have been cleansed by embracing and accepting the promise given to you in the covenant of grace. The promise that Christ struck, the covenant he struck with his own blood. He has washed you, he has cleansed you. He has granted you access to the Father through himself. Apart from the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we too would be characterized by this very same lying lips and deceitful tongue. If you're not in Christ today, this is what you, you, you have to come to grips with. You, you, have to, you have to recognize this from the Scriptures. This is true about you. If you are not in Christ, what is said in verses uh, 4 through 6 and, and 9 through 10 is true of you. You too are characterized by the same lying lips and deceitful tongue, flattering tongue, and a throat that's an open grave. That's a description of you, as unpleasant as it is. That is the truth. And the biggest lie of all that you tell and you believe is that you are good enough. The biggest deceit, the biggest scheme of the devil, the biggest lie he tells you, that he tells the lost person is that you're, you're fine. You're okay. God will accept you as you are. You're good enough. Biggest lie of all is the lie of your own goodness or your own righteousness. Young people in particular hear this. It is a great blessing to grow up in a Christian home, to grow up in a, in, in a church and, and to be, uh, have the word of God poured over you, both corporately and, and in your home. But there also comes with that a temptation for you to begin to think that I belong to a Christian family, I'm, I'm, I'm my, thanks to my parents, um, restraining outwardly the temptations of sin. I, I haven't really sinned in those grievous ways like other people in the world have, so I'm, I'm pretty good. Don't believe that lie. That is your own evil heart testifying a lie to you that you must reject on the authority of the Word of God. You are not good enough. You are not righteous unless the Lord Jesus Christ causes you to be born again, unless you embrace the gospel and believe that he alone is righteous to save. I mean, did not Jeremiah testify truly of every man and woman and child, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? Who can understand it? This is a true statement about the human condition, unless you were born again. But God has been so very merciful. If you will call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. That's a, that's a promise. That is a certainty. And we all need that mercy, not only to protect us from the enemies around us, but to protect us from being seduced by our own flesh. I mean, it's, it's one thing to be seduced by the lies out there, it's another thing to be seduced by the lies in here, isn't it? Now, what, what comes of God's mercy? What, what should his mercy produce? Look what David says. He says, I come according to the abundance of your steadfast love, according to your mercy. I will enter your house. Now, what does, so mercy gains him access, and then what? What comes next? He says, I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. David recognizes, even now, even in, 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 as a redeemed man, even the one who has access by faith into the very presence of God, David says, I still now stand by your mercy. I've gained access by your mercy, and I stand here. By your mercy. He says, I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear 
of you. Mercy ought to lead to worship of the triune God. Someone who has says, who testifies, I've, I've been born again, I've been washed of the blood, I, I, am, I have been reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you a worshiper? No, I don't really have a lot of interest in that. That doesn't go together. We've said last week, or two weeks ago, with respect to the Great Commission, three weeks ago, the central feature of the Great Commission is to make us worshipers. To make, to make a disciple is to make a worshiper. And, and David recognizes this. It's by mercy that he gains access to God, and it's by mercy that he wants to fall on his face in fear and reverence of the Lord. Mercy should lead to a prayer and an earnest desire to walk in actual righteousness before such a God who has shown us mercy. Mercy should lead to obedience. Mercy also should lead to humility. Look at verse 8 again. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. See, David recognizes just because he's brought, been brought now into the presence of God doesn't mean the enemies have just disappeared. The evil of the world hasn't just gone poof and it's gone. Sometimes we think as Christians, we come to faith in Christ, and now we live in sort of a holy bubble and nothing's going to happen to us. No evil will touch us anymore. We won't have temptations. We won't have sin. We won't have difficulties within and without, and that isn't true. And David recognizes this is humility. This is, I need the grace of God all over again. And again, we go back to the beginning of the psalm. Every morning, he's looking up. Every morning, he's reorienting himself. Every morning, 20, 20, 20, I've got to focus my eyes on the true and living God. We are dependent upon the Lord to guard us from the deceitful schemes of the evil one. Another commentator, when we are surrounded by liars and deceivers, it is only the Lord's guidance and his perfect will that keeps us from being seduced. I mean, do you believe that? Do you believe it's only the mercy of God that keeps you, that keeps me from being seduced? The perspective of the righteous is an expectation of being heard, being received by God. So as you go back now, I encourage you to go back and meditate on the psalm now. Think about this. The first and fifth stanzas should, should give you the, the opportunity to meditate upon the perspective of the righteous. It's an expectation of being heard by God, of, of having the capacity to reorient myself day by day by day with a Godward perspective of all the mess that I see in the world. I can look, to my, eye, look my eyes to heaven day by day by day. And then the, that second and, and fourth stanzas Here's the peril of the wicked. We, we need to think in both ways. They are a peril to us. The wicked are a peril to the faithful. But they are also a peril to themselves. They are in peril. And we ought to pray in both ways. We ought to pray that God would save them. We ought to pray that God would protect us from them. And lastly, as our eye goes to the middle, we're left on the only place that we can stand eternally. The abundance of God's steadfastness. His enduring mercy. The promise of Yahweh is all that we need. His covenant faithfulness expressed ultimately and finally in his own son stands as our certainty. Especially in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Father, we give you thanks for your word. Lord, will you encourage our hearts, our minds, our affections by means of your spirit working through us, working through the word as we have read and heard it together. I pray that you will grant us the grace to encourage one another, to exhort one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. Lord, will you make us more watchful of the seducing deceptions around us? Will you cause us to be more dependent upon the risen and exalted Christ and his word as our only sufficient, certain, and infallible guide? 
Will you cause us to love one another more and that that love will be expressed in exhorting one another to faithfulness, to belief, to believing the promises of our Savior, to encourage one another to hold fast to Christ who is worthy of our praise. We ask this in his name.